More than 80% of our plant-derived food intake comes from just 12 plant species. That's eight cereals and four tubers. But more than 30,000 different plant species are used as a source of food by people around the world. And as many as 50,000 different plant species are also used by people as traditional remedies. And this incredible diversity of plants is now under enormous threat. And the main threats being land conversion, when we convert land for agriculture, for biofuels, for development, we lose biodiversity. In East Sussex, in the south of England, the Millennium Seed Bank, which is part of Kew Botanical Gardens, is working to safeguard some of the most endangered plant species on the planet. It works in partnership with scientists and organisations all over the world to collect and store seeds, thereby protecting them against an uncertain future. But the seed bank is not just a store, it's very much a working facility. The main purpose of this building uh, is to act as a global facility, a world bank, if you like, um, to store uh, all of um, plant diversity and all of its, its beauty and also all of its usefulness. The overall goal is to collect the 10% of the world flora. Of course, you cannot do that without uh, collaboration, without partnership with uh, you know, different countries. So we've been working with partners uh, over the last 10 years uh, in about 53 countries currently, uh, over 120 partner institutions, not only to bank seeds here, but also to bank seeds in country. Uh, and not just to bank the seeds, that's also an important point. The seeds are there to be used. Uh, and most of the people in this building are involved with enabling the use uh, of those species. Seeds are sent here from all over the world because the Millennium Seed Bank is the hub of a scientific network devoted to plant preservation. When the seeds arrive here, it's not just a simple matter of placing them on a shelf in a darkened room. There are several crucial steps to be taken before staff are certain that the seeds are ready to be stored. We check all the collections to make sure that they match paperwork and that we have all the permits. We then inspect the collections to make sure they're dry and not infested. Once that is sorted out and it's quite clear that you get what is in the content and what the partners have sent over, uh, if all that is clear, uh, you bring the seed in this particular room. This is our dry room. The first and most important thing that we need to do is to dry those seeds. And we use a, a controlled environment of 15 degrees centigrade and 15% relative humidity, which allows the seeds to gently lose moisture to the surrounding air. And this brings the moisture content of the seeds down to about 5% of their fresh weight over a period of a few weeks. Uh, and that slows the metabolism of the seed right down um, so that it's, it's asleep, deeply asleep, uh, if you like. The seed comes in in various forms, sometimes in its fruit, um, sometimes just as the seed. This is quite small. Uh, you have small containers and big containers. Uh, some look, yeah, I can open this. These are specific palm, okay, like big marbles. Um, from Australia, you can see from Canada, from Mauritius, from Mali, from Malawi. Uh, South Africa, Chile. Again, these are some palms. Another type of seed. So you have different size, different colors, different way, different form, different. Uh, it's really, yeah, it's really fun to you know to be working with you know, all those sort of uh, materials. You never get bored. The seeds are dried for anything up to six months in order to increase storage life and to kill pests. Once this stage is over, the seeds move on. Once we've dried the seeds, the next step is to, to clean the seeds, to separate the seeds from the rest of the plant material that would have been uh, gathered at the time of harvest, that stem and flower material and um, other debris and so on. Uh, this is a process which we do um, almost entirely by hand. Because we're dealing with such an incredible diversity of seeds that that differ in, in shape and size and various covering structures, um, we, it's simply not possible to mechanise the process. 
So our staff use a simple system of rubber bungs and sieves um, to separate the seeds out from these structures. We use a column of air to blow through the sample which um, hopefully um, enables the heavy filled healthy seeds to, to be held back while the lighter empty and poorly developed seeds are, are blown off and um, can be discarded. Perhaps the only sophisticated, um, more scientific aspect of the, this part of the processing is that we use a digital x-ray machine which captures an image of the internal structures of the seed which will confirm that the seed is healthy and contains a well-developed mature embryo and that the seed is not um, immature or may be infested by an insect larvae. When the seeds arrive here, it's not just a simple matter of placing them on a shelf in a darkened room. During cleaning, the seeds were exposed to air containing moisture, so they must be dried out again before being finally stored. So our clean collections go downstairs into the dry room, which is um, adjacent to our, our seed storage vaults, and they are, the final drying stage is completed. And it's at that point, the seeds the now re-dried seeds are put into a suitable container and we have a range of containers that we use for storing our seeds depending mainly on the size of the seeds and the volume of the collection. And we seal the seeds in those uh, containers and then they're committed to long-term storage in our vaults at minus 20 degrees centigrade. So in the same way that we have a, a simple rule of thumb around the drying of seeds and the effect of drying on longevity, there's a rule of thumb about cooling seeds, which says that for each five degrees that seeds are cooled, um, storability also doubles. So you can see that cooling seeds from uh, ambient temperatures of say 20 degrees centigrade down to minus 20 also uh, increases the storability by orders of magnitude. And so with those two combined effects of drying and then cooling, we expect that most species in our seed bank will live for, for decades, um, hundreds of years in many cases, and who knows, some species will probably survive uh, well into the next millennium. But how do we know if the seeds are surviving at such low temperatures? The only sure test is to remove a sample of seeds at regular intervals and grow them. We pull a small proportion out, uh, 100 seeds will come out of the collection and those we try to germinate. Every single collection that comes into this building we try to germinate. When we take our collections out of the seed bank for germination testing, we need to choose the, the right conditions uh, that will enable those seeds to germinate. And this, very often involves a bit of detective work. This is a, uh, it's called a two-way thermogradient plate. Uh, and the way it operates is to produce a gradient of temperature from cold to hot during the daytime in that direction, and then from cold to hot uh, during the night in that direction. And what it means is that every single position um, marked by these petri dishes in this experiment, um, we, experiences a unique uh, diurnal uh, temperature uh, environment. Um, and you can see by the number of dishes that we have in this particular experiment, it gives us uh, an opportunity in one shot to look at a very wide range of temperature combinations. And we would use this equipment as a kind of range finding device to identify temperatures which appear to be suitable for germination. Uh, we can identify those temperatures and then replicate them and can uh, then conduct more detailed experiments in our temperature controlled incubators. So some of these incubators here, for example, this one operates at 25 degrees during the daytime and 15 degrees during the night. And, and the reason uh, that that's important is that uh, seeds of many species, and particularly species that have very tiny seeds, have evolved so that they only germinate when the seeds are close to the soil surface. And the reason, or the way in which seeds are able to detect when they're close to the soil surface is by measuring this difference between day and nighttime temperatures. And if we try and germinate those seeds 
at a constant temperature of say 15 or 20 degrees, the seed simply won't germinate. The overall goal is to collect the 10% of the world flora. Of course, you cannot do that without uh, collaboration, without partnership with uh, you know, different countries. Uh, it's during that, the, the, the build-up of that partnership that uh, you enter a kind of negotiation phase with partners. Uh, you take into account their uh, priorities. Because if you go to X country, to Mali, for example, the partner will tell you, yeah, you want to collect seed, that's fine. But there's an urgent need to conserve X or Y species. Uh, so we put that as a, our priority also for, for the project, to get quickly uh, those plants and the seed of those plants and then to conserve. Well, the, the story that I always like to tell, which illustrates our partnerships with uh, other countries, um, is that years ago I was working in the Muchinga Mountains in, in Zambia, in central Zambia. Uh, and I worked with a herbalist there, an African medicine man, if you like, uh, who pointed out up in the tops of one of the trees a mistletoe species. And he said, do you know what we call that? We call that Mpumba Makoa, which means the thing that is where it should not be. And he smiled when he said it, and he said, we sometimes use the same expression for Englishmen who come into our forest, and we don't really know what they do. So our philosophy right from the beginning was not to go into other people's countries and tell them what they should be doing. It was to go into other people's countries with a central idea around banking of seeds of wild species, um, of utility to man, rare species, uh, threatened species, and so on. But that, that was it. Uh, and that means that every partnership that we have developed is unique, uh, and it's based on their national priorities, not our priorities. Uh, and they can use this facility as they wish. Seed collection is a carefully organised process, often involving scientists from different countries coming together for one purpose, to find the seeds of plants and collect them. But to do that, they need to know where to go and when. Before organising a collecting uh, activity uh, in the field, uh, for the whole project, we have what we call the targeting team which work on what we call the collecting guide. Uh, it's collect all the information related to the geolocality of the species, uh, the likelihood period of time of fruiting of the, the, the species, uh, where we can find them, and when we can find them in fruit, yeah, and when the fruit mature and so on. Like in this country, obviously, we have guidebooks. So you go just wandering around and you open your book and all the species are in there. Some countries don't have anything like that at all. To date, we have produced over 30 of these collection guides, but obviously it's an ongoing process. All the information in those is based on herbarium specimens, which we find here in the herbarium. Um, each collection, which has been collected for hundreds of years, these specimens, um, has a locality and a date of where that specimen was found. So from that, we can georeference every specimen, which means we can apply a specific latitude and longitude to that particular plant. In addition to that, we also have the dates of when each of these species were collected. So for every specimen, again, there should be a date, at least a month of collection. We can compare that date with the state of the pressed plant, whether it's got a flower on it, whether it's got a fruit or whether it's sterile. And therefore we can tell if it was collected in March and it has a fruit, at some point it fruits in March. And it's as simple as that really. So on the front of the page here we have the picture of the herbarium specimen, showing obviously fruiting if possible. And then on the other side, for the same species, we have the plant description, habitat, uses, some local distribution notes, then these points on the map are where our species or specimens, sorry, have been found. So many countries have no specific flora or field guides. So for those places, we concentrate on what we call the three E's. And that is to say the plants are either endemic, which is, it means they've got a very limited distribution, whether that's a certain area or continent, but we're concentrating mainly on those that are endemic or found only in one specific country or even a specific area within a country. 
The second E is endangered. And again, we, um, we have a series of methodologies that we use to find out a level of threat. And therefore, we, we pick the ones that are, we feel that are most threatened. And the third is economically important plants, which again, for some of these countries, it's really important for them to be able to sustain and put some more research into those species. We tend to forget that um, the vast majority of people rely on wild plant species for their medicines. For example, three quarters of the world's people use traditional medicines uh, and plants are a big part of that. About 5,000 plant species are used that way in China, 7,000 in India and, and so on. And those are not stored in conventional seed banks. Currently we think that about 90% of all of the flowering plant species on Earth have evolved seeds that are suited to this technology, to drying and storage um, in conventional seed banks. However, um, the remaining species um, have not evolved this ability to withstand drying. Um, and if the seeds are, are dried, um, uh, they lose viability very quickly. And we call these seeds recalcitrant uh, because they, they are difficult and awkward. Um, and one of the important areas of research that we carry out uh, in this building and also with our partners is understanding how we can keep those recalcitrant seeds alive for as long as possible. This is a jar of shoot cultures where we started off with um, um, small material and then multiplied. Um, so there are a large number of shoots in this, um, in this pot. So we can take a small piece of um, uh, material in, um, it should include a growing point, and um, that material is um, encapsulated in a bead. Um, it's like a small um, globule thing. What, what, what we do is we mix two chemicals. One is called um, um, sodium alginate and calcium chloride. When we drop the sodium alginate into calcium chloride, as Poppy is doing now, um, you make a bead trapping that plant material inside. And once you've done that, you can put that plant material in liquid nitrogen and uh, you can st um, store that forever. Uh, so that is called cryopreservation. Once the beads are made, the plant material with the beads will undergo a series of treatments um, with the solutions which will prepare these beads uh, for storing in liquid nitrogen. Once it is in liquid nitrogen, they can be stored forever. If you want to take that beads or the plant material um, out of liquid nitrogen, and then if you want to grow it again, you can take that material, then warm it in a water bath around 40 degrees centigrade. And then we can put it into a medium where it will grow. And the, from the bead, the plant material will just pop out uh, slowly. And that will grow and then multiply in that um, medium. We have got around um, 60 to 70 species of plants, uh, which all have got very high conservation rating according to the um, World Conservation Union. Um, but we are trying to grow more um, plants in culture and eventually in um, store in liquid nitrogen. Some of those plants are extinct in the wild, um, or the last plant remaining in the wild, or which are critically endangered, that means maybe only 10 or 15 or 20 plants left in the wild. So, the work of the Millennium Seed Bank and its partners involves finding plants and their seeds. These seeds are dried and cleaned for storage and then regrown to check that they are still viable. These plants are now mostly safe from extinction. The 10% of seeds that cannot be stored in this way are being researched and some of them cryopreserved at minus 196 degrees Celsius. But they don't just put these seeds into the vault and lock the door, leaving them there for future generations. These seeds are being used now. So our contribution is to get the seed, at least some fragment of the plant, that can be regenerated later in the future. And even not in the future, for some restoration program, we can regenerate those plants and then put them back in their natural habitat. That's really the meaning of the seed because it's, it's a last resort when you have nothing left from the plant itself. You can still have the seed 
which is you know the the, the plant component in in a miniature plant which you can grow and then put it back uh, in in nature for uh, the natural environment. In a nutshell, the Millennium Seed Bank project and this facility, the Millennium Seed Bank, uh, are important globally because they are the repository of the largest collection of plant diversity in the world. If you go down to the vaults downstairs, you are standing on the world's hottest biodiversity hotspot. Um, but critically, we can use those seeds, uh, and we are using those seeds and enabling other people to use those seeds on a daily basis. And the use of those seeds and, and the plants that come from those seeds are essential for human development, uh, human adaptation to climate change, to land use degradation, and human survival, ultimately. Uh, and that really is our, our role going forward. I'd like to emphasize that we are not a doomsday vault. We're not something to be opened up when apocalypse happens and the end of the world has arrived. Uh, we are a working facility uh, looking for solutions involved in research that has real applications for people uh, and for this planet generally. Uh, and that we see as our role and an extremely important role uh, far into the future.